Hello, and welcome to this edition of Quality of Life. I'm your host, Dave Augustine. Today we are going to talk about the GI system. Joining us today to help us discuss this topic is Dr. Marla Wolfert from Purveya Health. Welcome to the show, Dr. Wolfert. Thank you. Um, currently, your offices are located at the Purveya St. Nicholas Health mm -hmm. Clinic yep, on Taylor. Yep, 1621 uh, North Taylor. Okay. What type of office hours do you handle? Uh, our office is open from 8 to 5. Um, we do procedures uh, Monday through Friday um, and then have office hours as well. Okay. Could you go in a little bit of your background, your educational background, where you're yeah, from, um, how long you've been in the area? I actually grew up in Sheboygan County, um, went away for school. Um, I did uh, undergrad and medical school at UW-Madison, um, and then I went to Chicago for the rest of my medical training. Um, and I did my GI fellowship at Loyola University. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. Um, the GI system, can you give us a description of what does it all consist of? Yeah. yeah. So the GI system is pretty broad. Um, it includes um, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine, um, but it also includes the pancreas, liver, and bile ducts. Wow, I didn't know it was the pancreas and liver. Yeah, yeah. So they, they contribute to digestion and um, you know uh, absorption of food, mm -hmm. so they're included in the GI system as well. Okay. How long is the specialty of GI been around? Yeah, G GI's been around a long time. It's one of the first um, recognized specialties within internal medicine, um, and it's actually been a board-certified specialty since 1941. Okay. What are some of the disorders or issues, diseases that can occur with the GI system? You know, the, the most common things um, are things like um, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel disease, like Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, also, reflux is a very common thing, mm -hmm. uh, and with that, ulcers. Um, and then with the liver being included, um, we see a lot of hepatitis and cirrhosis as well. Okay. Could you go into a little bit more detail about the bowel diseases with the inflammation? Yeah. So um, the, the main bowel diseases that we see are uh, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Um, these are inflammatory conditions of the intestines um, where the, the immune system attacks the um, intestines. Uh, the way we differentiate Crohn's disease from ulcerative colitis is Crohn's disease can affect any part of the GI tract from the mouth all the way down um, to the large intestine where ulcerative colitis is primarily just in the large intestine. Okay. Um, I've always wondered uh, with some of the foods we eat and how does that affect, the, or does the GI system affect that or handle it? Because once in a while, you know, people can become constipated and then the next time it's you know, yeah. like a river, so to speak. Well, I guess what's the <laughs> difference? How does your body know or react? Yeah, um, your body reacts um, through digestion. Um, some people are more sensitive to foods um, than others, and it all depends on the type of, you know, if you have an underlying um, condition or, you know, a lot of people have irritable bowel disease, mm -hmm. which definitely affects your um, um, sensitivities to food, and people can get diarrhea on one occasion and constipation on another. And um, the mechanism behind that isn't totally understood, um, but uh, we do see it a lot. Okay. And we do have treatments available. Okay. What causes an ulcer? What causes an ulcer? Um, in general, it's acid production. Um, there, it, in the early 2000s, they did identify a bacteria as well that can cause ulcers. Uh, it's something called Helicobacter pylori. Um, and that is... Um, a more common cause of ulcers, um, but that's less commonly seen in the mm -hmm. U.S. than other parts of the world. Um, certain medications can also contrib contribute to ulcers like um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications like ibuprofen and um, aspirin and, and those types of medication. Okay. Are there different types of ulcers? Because I've heard, you know, you have an ulcer, and I hear, well, it's a bleeding ulcer. You know. There are. There's... Um, the severity is mostly where it, that um, mm -hmm. differs. Um, many people have ulcers um, and 
don't have symptoms, some have a lot of symptoms, and the most common type of ulcer is um, an ulcer in the stomach. You can also get ulcers in your esophagus and in your small intestine. Um, it, severe ulcers can bleed, mm -hmm. um, and those often end up, people end up in the hospital. And usually people don't have a lot of symptoms leading up to those. Um, they don't have the pain and, and the reflux with that. They just come in bleeding. Um, and then finally, ulcers can go all the way through the lining of the, the stomach or intestine and cause a perforation or a, a hole in, in the intestines. And that's the most serious that's type yeah. of ulcer. One that would probably require surgery, where yep. other ones can be handled with medication or diet change or exactly. less stress, exactly. <laughs> as far as that goes. <laughs> um, you touched them on them before, but what is Crohn's disease? So Crohn's disease is an inflammatory condition. It's an autoimmune condition um, that where the body attacks the, the lining of the intestines. Okay. Um, we're not exactly sure what causes it, there is a genetic predisposition um, because we do see it more commonly in families, but that's not 100%. Um, there is also um, certain triggers that we think there are in the environment, um, be it diet or um, certain bacteria that may mm -hmm. go through your system and, and trigger the inflammatory condition in your, activate your immune system to to start attacking your own, your own intestines. Wow, interesting. Now, you also mentioned colitis. Mm -hmm. What is that about? So that's um, just of the colon. Okay. Um, the most common type of colitis is an ulcerative colitis. There are other less common types, um, like infectious colitis, um, w which is, um, you know, can be treated mm -hmm. with the antibiotics where ulcerative colitis is more of a lifelong condition. Okay. Now, one thing I heard a few people say about, and actually a few people I know about, um, they had a condition called diverticulitis. Mm -hmm. Could you explain a little bit what that's all about? So diverticulitis is a infectious um, type of uh, condition of the colon or mm -hmm. large intestine. Um, what happens is uh, as we get older, certain people get these little out pouches in the colon um, we're not entirely sure why some people get that and other people don't. Again, it could be diet, it could be um, some genetic predisposition, but what happens is stool can get um, impacted in those little out pouches and cause an infection. Okay. Um, and that's what we call diverticulitis. So a lot of people have diverticulosis, which is just the out pouches, and very few people actually get diverticulitis. Okay. I know a few people, well, my sister was one, and then a, another friend of mine who had it where actually my friend had to have, go in for surgery and mm -hmm. actually took out the piece that was. Um... Yeah, and that again def depends on severity and the number of episodes somebody gets. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're having frequent episodes of diverticulitis, to prevent future episodes and severe episodes in the future, we, we do often recommend removing that part of the mm -hmm. colon. Because I know, <clears throat> excuse me, from the side effects, uh, at least my friend, I mean, it could be as simple as eating a strawberry and the seeds or whatever get mm -hmm. stuck in those pouches. In a matter of a half an hour, I've seen them go from fine to rolling with the sweats and yeah. can hardly stand up. You know, he gets so sick about it, it hits mm -hmm. that fast. Yeah, I mean, it, it can um, definitely come on quickly. Um, the thing is, it usually is very treatable, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, there's actually more and more debate about whether seeds and nuts actually play a role. Um, some people do notice that, but um, about five years ago, they did this large, over 10,000 person study showing that seeds and nuts may actually not contribute as much as we previously thought. Um, so I don't no longer tell my mm -hmm. patients they have to avoid it unless they notice yeah. those symptoms when yeah. they eat it. Could be more just, you know, the smaller content of the food that doesn't yeah. go through or digest as much. I mean, it could be a, a raisin or whatever. I exactly. Mean. A, a high fiber diet is what um, is recommended. And that's um, to give the stool more bulk so that it doesn't go into those little pouches and it stays in the, the main part of the intestines. Okay. 
how many cases would you say on average, let's say a month or even a year, that you see with you know issues with the GI system? Um, we see it a lot. Um, you know, I, I, I see you know up to fifteen people a day um, who have some sort of GI issue. Um, and I think that's just the tip of the iceberg yep. is oftentimes people delay coming in sure. and, and don't um, necessarily want to see the doctor because a lot of people want to avoid that colonoscopy. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Would you say the trend is increasing, holding its own or decreasing based on, you know, you always see the obesity rates of the U.S. Yeah. and the way our foods are. Do you see that trend also climbing or is it holding its own? I think it depends on what type of condition. Um, a lot of GI conditions are related to weight um, and obesity. And so we are seeing certain things more common. Um, reflux is definitely more common as, um, the, as somebody gains weight because mm -hmm. you have that extra pressure on the stomach causing acid to reflux up into your esophagus. So that can lead to um, issues with the esophagus, uh, a lot of heartburn and um, you know those type of symptoms. There, there's also um, data to suggest that the incidence of Crohn's colitis is increasing in mm -hmm. the U.S. as well. Okay, with the specialties and the medications that are prescribed nowadays, you know, diabetes they have you know, mm -hmm. medications for that, cholesterol they have medications for that, you know, it's really fine tuned. Do you see that also affecting, you know? providing or giving Yeah, ulcers. I think there's, there's more and more medications available. Um, but I also think that um, there's more and more known every day about um, the way diet mm -hmm. and, um, you know, just our lifestyle plays a role in certain GI disorders. Um, so oftentimes, you know, people who come to see me don't want to take a medication and we're able to fine-tune their lifestyles so mm -hmm. that they can avoid that. That's not the case in every, every instance, but um, you know, it, those lifestyle changes do help as well. Sure. One thing you also mentioned um, briefly is hepatitis. Mm -hmm. Could you go into that a little bit? So hepatitis is a, just a general term for inflammation in the liver. Um, the, the two most common types people have heard about are viral hepatitis, like hepatitis A, B or C, mm -hmm. um, and then also alcohol-related liver disease. And, and those are definitely um, the most common, but there are several other types of hepatitis um, that we see commonly. Um, it's just not as, as talked about, such as autoimmune types or hereditary forms of hepatitis. Okay. If I'm developing a GI condition, what are some of the symptoms Excuse me, I should be aware of? So um, the symptoms can vary uh, considerably. Um, a lot of people have pain. Some people have diarrhea. Um, some people have um, constipation. Other people just lose weight and we're not sure why. Um, I just should also mention colon mm -hmm. cancer oftentimes doesn't present with any symptoms right. until it's very advanced stages. So the symptoms can vary considerably. Okay, and that was my next um subject is colon cancer, which you had mentioned. Um, where do polyps come from or where does it start, you know, which then turns into colon cancer? So polyps are little growths in the colon. Um, they're small little, you know, when we look at them in the, at the time of colonoscopy, they're little bumps in the colon. Um, they're seen as people get older um, and then there's certain other things mm -hmm. that can tr contribute to them. Um, it's Similar to other types of cancer, um, as we age, we get more um, genetic variation in our cells, and those mutations can lead to dysregulation of, of cell growth and um, overproduction. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, those polyps can change more and more and turn into cancer. Okay. Um, I had my first polyp when I was 30 years old, so I mm -hmm. got on a three-year plan as yep. far as that goes, <laughs> so as far as colonoscopies. Um, which brings us to our next subject is what are some of the diagnostic technologies they use nowadays? Yeah, so there's your standard um, EGD and colonoscopy, which are um, a visual examination of the GI tract. 
Um, with the, the EGD, we're able to look at the esophagus, stomach, and the first part of the small intestine. And with the colonoscopy, we're able to look at the colon and then just the very end of the small intestine. So with both of those tests, we don't get a great look at um, this, the entire small intestines, mm -hmm. and there's about 20 feet that left that we don't see. Luckily, small intestine disorders are much less common than okay. the other kinds, um, but there is a, a pill camera available um, to look at the rest of the small intestine if we need to. Um, and that's changed care a lot because now we can actually see what's going on in that mm -hmm. area without just, you know, without just guessing or trying to rely on CT scans sure. or other imaging that don't give us as much information. Wow, so you can swallow a camera and that too shall pass. Yes, How about yes. that? <laughs> the only thing about that is we aren't able to biopsy with that yeah. like we are with sure. the other two procedures. So. But it could give you at least an indication what's going on, so that way you can take the next step if exactly, you have to, exactly. as far as that goes. Um, okay, that's excellent. What about with um, medicines, or what do you usually use for treatments? You know, some of the medicines you may prescribe. You know, I think the most common prescription we see in our office is things for reflux. Mm -hmm. um, there are several different types of medications available for reflux. Um, mainly being um, your proton pump inhibitors are the most common, things like omeprazole, lanzoprazole, pantoprazole. There's a whole host of them, and um, they vary in their strength, and, and that mm -hmm. determines how we, um, which one we're going to give a patient. There's also less um, strong medications um, that are available over the counter um, that block histamine and block acid in the stomach that way. Um, and I would say that is our, definitely our most common medication mm -hmm. as reflux is so common these days. What about um, medications you can purchase like um, Maalox or you know, milk of magnesia, yeah. things like those? So Maalox is, um, a, Maalox, um, Tums, Gaviscon, all those medications work good for immediate relief of, of mm -hmm. acid reflux. Um, the other the pills tend to work better to prevent sure. symptoms in the future. Um, then there's a whole host of other medications available for diarrhea, constipation. Um, I prescribe fiber a lot because <laughs> I think it helps um, with a, a, a vast majority mm -hmm. of people's symptoms. Um, so that's always a, a good thing to try um, when you're either having constipation or diarrhea. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there's, you know, specific anti-diarrheals or um, over-the-counter laxatives that we can use as well. Okay. How often should I be checked for my GI system? So, um, in general, colon cancer is what we check for yeah. on a, in everybody. Mm -hmm. It's recommended that um, as soon as you turn 50, you start having your colonoscopy. Um, and that's to check for polyps and remove the polyps so that they don't sure. turn into cancer. 90% um, of colon cancers do occur after the age of 50, and that's why it's recommended to start at age 50. If you do have other risk factors that put you at higher risk for colon cancer, it's recommended to start earlier. And then in general, everybody else, it really depends on symptoms. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's no need to you know, get a colonoscopy at the age of 20 unless you're having symptoms. Um, and then, you know, as for colon cancer screening, it's recommended at the very least to do it every 10 years. But mm -hmm. if you have polyps, you do have to come back sooner, as you mentioned yeah. before. I, mean, I think now <laughs> I graduated to the five-year plan, yes. where before I was on the three-year plan. It, it's usually three or five, so yeah. it's, it's not too often. <laughs> I think the worst thing about that people don't like about colonoscopies is the prep. Yeah, the prep is definitely the worst part of the entire test. Um, unfortunately, there's no way around it because without cleaning out the colon, we're right. not able to see anything. And most of the screening tests for uh, colon cancer do require a PrEP. Right. Fortunately, the PrEP has changed a lot in the last 15 mm -hmm. years. Um, now we use a lot lower volume PrEP. Um, we're able to split it up so you're not drinking that, all that liquid yeah. at once. Um, it's a little better tasting. Yeah. I don't want to say it tastes great because no. <laughs> it's still a medication, so it's not going to taste wonderful. But um, what's nicer, it's, it's usually a lot less, and you yeah. get to follow it with 
um, a liquid of your choice. Sure. Like light beer? <laughs> Tastes great, less filling. I, there I don't you know go. About that, but <laughs> <laughs> I know that was one of the things, the first ones I had, you almost had to drink like a gallon of that yeah. wonderful cherry flavored chalky mix. And, mm -hmm. and he says, You have to drink it all. Well, you get halfway down and yeah, you can't you just hold it feel down full. anymore. Exactly. Yeah. No, you yeah. got to keep drinking, you know. And, it's nice now that it's a much lower yeah. volume. And um, I oftentimes split it up between half at night and half in yeah. the morning. So it gives your your system a break in between and yeah. actually it helps clean you out much better when you do that exactly it's a lot better than when you used to have to use enemas and everything yes. from the early days yes. it's like wow so it's changed a lot and i think they'll continue to improve it um but no matter what i think you'll always have to do some sort of prep and sure. have to spend most of the night on the toilet the night sure. before <laughs> sure i know my wife when she has hers she's actually allergic and can't keep any of the Okay. preps down so she has to go the natural way and just drink water and let her system clean itself yeah, out so yeah by the time it's over she's really hungry as yes. far as that goes so <laughs> then it's several days without eating yeah. so who can perform a colonoscopy i mean people like yourselves yeah. in your specialty i know surgeons have done it so who can really perform a colonoscopy so you need to have training in um colonoscopies uh in general all gastroenterologists are trained um, to do colonoscopies. Um, some general surgeons are trained. Um, I think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, more general surgeons were trained. Um, but as people are coming out of their training now, um, they, they are getting less of that just mm -hmm. because uh, the field of gastroenterology has um, picked up sure. considerably over the last few years. Um, so those are the general two. There are a few family doctors um, in the country who still do colonoscopies. And again, they tend to be older physicians who um, were trained years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, that's definitely not right. something that's still happening today. Right. I know you always hear the cases of, you know, people at a colonoscopy, it should be a routine thing, then they wind up, you know, uh, piercing the intestine mm -hmm. or the bowel. Is, is it, how likely is that to happen? That's actually very rare. Um, less than one in a thousand. Um, so it's it's very uncommon, especially in somebody who is um, trained well in um, colonoscopy technique. Um, and that's, I think, why some of the, mm -hmm. the, you'll hear less and less of these other specialties doing it. So the colonoscopy, they put you out pretty much nowadays. Yes. Compared to yes. the early days where you were still awake and everything. The early days, people were unsedated and watched the whole thing. Yep. Um, these days, most people um, are completely asleep the entire yep. test. It's not a general anesthesia, um, so occasionally somebody will wake up during the test, but we always give more medication to make sure you're mm -hmm. comfortable. Um, and I think over the years, the focus on comfort has really yeah. um, become a forefront and, and it's less of an issue yeah. than it was even 15 years ago. Right. I know the one colonoscopy I had, and the doctor's retired so I can use his name, but um, I had Dr. Lisberg. Mm -hmm. And I kept waking up, you know, and I'd point at the camera, well, look at that, what's that, look at that, what's that? So then yeah. he says, give him some more, I don't like him moving around like that, <laughs> so he had to keep knocking me out. Yeah, yeah. You know, as far as that goes, or the first one I had, to give me the camera, here, do you want to look? So I got to look and Mm -hmm. It was interesting yeah. as far as that goes. Yeah. And, you know, some people don't mind and are interested by it and want to watch. Mm -hmm. um, that's not <laughs> the majority. Yeah. And we realize that. We want to make that the, yeah. the procedure the best experience mm -hmm. we can for, for patients because um, yeah. we realize it's not necessarily a fun thing to, right. to have done. And I think, again, it comes to the prep. Because mm -hmm. the colonoscopy itself, you're pretty much out, so you really don't feel much of anything, yep. you know, when they give you the, you know, the medication to yeah. knock you out. I mean, the last one I had, they, I had to swallow the camera as well because they found out I do have a bleeding ulcer in my esophagus, so I'm taking mm -hmm. meds for that. But, you know, other than that, it wasn't bad. You know, the last ones aren't bad, so they've come a long way mm -hmm. you know, as far as that goes. Yep. Uh, is there anything I can do from my lifestyle to help, um, you know, prevent yeah. colon disease or GI so in, issues? Uh, with most um, gastrointestinal disorders, um, 
following a healthy lifestyle, things that are going to be healthy for um, your mm. other organs helps with your colon as well. Um, a high fiber diet does um, reduce your risk of colon cancer. Um, it also helps treat constipation and diarrhea and can be very helpful for irritable bowel um, syndrome. Um, maintaining a healthy weight through diet and exercise can help with reflux, colon cancer, um, basically every disease I've talked about today. Um, so, you know, like most other uh, physicians, we mm -hmm. recommend, you know, re regular exercise, eating a high fiber diet with uh, fruits and vegetables and trying to watch your uh, intake of saturated fats and those types of things. And then, of course, um, quitting smoking and limiting your alcohol is helpful mm -hmm. as well. So you can't do anything fun and you'll be fine. <laughs> no, just kidding, just kidding. Yep. <laughs> so, um, we have to wrap pretty quick. So do you have any final thoughts as far as Yeah, advice? I mean, I think the most important um, thing people can do is to get their screening colonoscopy when they turn 50. Um, that's the one thing you can do to prevent colon cancer um, that has the most, um, that's the most effective at preventing colon mm -hmm. cancer. So um, while it's, it's not the most pleasant thing, um, and you don't want to do it every day, it's, it is very important and um, can help prevent any uh, future problems. So. Okay, um, just briefly, where can I go to read about or find out more? I mean, is yeah, there so websites or what, you, do you have a website available? Uh, the Prevea website has a lot of information and that's www.prevea.com and that's P-R-E-V-E-A. Um, I also think the, the Mayo Clinic website has a lot of general information, information about a lot of uh, GI mm -hmm. disorders. Um, if you want to know something specific about um, Crohn's or colitis, there's the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation of okay. America. That's good. Um, and then the American Cancer Society is always good for colon cancer. Okay, wonderful. Well, Dr. Wolfert, I'd like to thank you for coming on our show yeah. and talking about the GI system. It's been a pleasure having you. My pleasure to be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you as well. Um, this concludes our episode of Quality of Life, the GI System. Um, I'm your host, Dave Augustine, and if you have any questions or suggestions, please contact us on our website at www.wscssheboygan.com. Thanks for watching. <laughs>